it gives me great pleasure to hand the meeting over to Carol L, who is sharing with us um, on the topic of enlightenment. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Charlotte, and everybody who does service, and my friends who come to support me, and all of you that I'm meeting tonight and seeing again. I am an alcoholic, and my name is Carol, and I'm really honored and grateful to be here. And I was given the gift of sobriety in Fort Worth, Texas on May 1st, 1988 at the Glass House Group. And I'm really honored and blessed that I get to stay sober a day at a time for 12,753 days. And today's 34 years and 11 months. And the time went really quick when I look back. It doesn't seem like that long. And some days it seems like days are a year long. It's just how it goes. And Gordon asked me to share on the topic of enlightenment. You know, when I got sober and came to Alcoholics Anonymous, you used a lot of words that I didn't know. And they told me to listen to the music until I could understand the words. And I didn't know restless, irritable, and discontent. Those weren't part of my vocabularies. Or pray about it, or pause, or all these other words and enlightenment isn't a word I think I've ever used in all my years of sobriety. So I was trying to figure out what enlightenment is. And I'm thinking, you know, when I'm, when I'm trying to lighten my burden, maybe I'm carrying all these things around. So when I work through the steps, especially when I got to four and five and then eight and nine, and you know, it felt like I was carrying a backpack and all of these things were rocks. And I'm carrying all this weight around that really I didn't need to carry. And if I want to lighten my burden, I have to remove things. And that's what happens when I get sober. And so enlightened. So if I want to make something lighter, right? If I'm baking and I want to make it lighter, I whip a lot of air into it to make it lighter and frothier. If I want to make a burden lighter, I share it with you. I give it to God and I work the steps and it seems to go away quicker and not be so heavy. And I was reading a book many years ago, and it was a little girl, and she saw a word she didn't know what it was, and it was a word she really didn't need to know. She was about six or seven years old, and she goes to her dad, and she goes, Dad, what does so-and-so mean? And he was a watch repairman, and he picked up this heavy suitcase full of watch parts, and he said, pick that up. And she tried, and she goes, Papa, it's too heavy. I can't lift it. And he said, that's how some knowledge is, that it's too heavy to know, but when we're ready to know it, then we'll be able to do that. And that's kind of what some of these things in Alcoholics Anonymous have been for me. But I looked up the word enlightenment. And this is something I really like. And it says, spiritual enlightenment, a path to connect with the supreme power, God, while still churning out our worldly responsibilities. It's not only connecting to God, but a sense of deeper connection with inner self and deeper faith in humanity. It's an awareness of the world and a release of all pain and suffering. No longer feeling fear or aim to protect oneself. When confronted with something that would provoke negative emotions, instead, enlightened people only feel love and understanding. Spiritual enlightenment is not a destination, but the journey itself. We can never arrive at enlightenment, only practice it every day. The more we are able to act from a place of love, understanding and non-judgment, and release all expectations of life, the more we are in line with the principles of spiritual enlightenment. I really like that. And God's presence in my life now transforms and redirects my mental and physical activities. And that's what the program of Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me. Working through the steps and the steps are spiritual. It says it's spiritual and principles. And so are the traditions and so are the concepts and they're all interconnected. And we used to talk about it a lot, but we don't hear it very much anymore. One of the things is it says, it's not the destination, it's the journey that counts. And in the back of the big book, we have something, and it's called Appendix A, and it's the spiritual experience. And in there, it talks about a spiritual experience and a spiritual awakening where a little, they are a little different. And 
it talks about personality change and sudden revolutionary changes and transformations and unexpected inner resources and God consciousness. And, and it talks about contempt prior to investigation because that's what I did when I got to you. And you can read it, but it keeps using the word change a lot. And I read something once when I was going through a lot of change and it said, changes are gifts really. It means I'm progressing on course. See, I don't wanna just tread water. Then I'm not going anywhere. Just like step 10 and 11 and 12 people say it's maintenance steps. No, then I'm walking on a treadmill and I'm putting a lot of effort in, but I am not going anywhere. I have to put in the work because it says I grow in understanding and effectiveness. So I'm lightening my load and my burdens when I come into Alcoholics Anonymous and I share my story with you. And you go through the steps with me and I go through them with my sponsor. And then we learn what's mine and what's not. And what I let affect me and color my world. And not in a positive way for all those years till I made it to you at the age of 37 and a half. And I'm a little over 72 right now. And I get to change and I get to see things differently. And I get to keep having awakenings and awarenesses sober. Even now with almost a month shy of 35 years. I get to keep seeing things different. My big book is full of promises. And the stories also have promises. And I like to tell you that the last two pages of Keys to the Kingdom, I take that as a promise. It says, I will never outgrow this program. It allows for limitless expansion. And then it goes on and it says somewhere down the page that where I used to run from responsibility, I find myself attacking it with surprising vigor. And I get to look at things enthusiastically and not like dread. Oh, I don't want to do that. No, I get to look for, okay, God, how's this going to go? What's going to happen here? Now, when I got sober and came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and if you told me one day that God would be the most important thing in my life, that I would be praying a lot all day and using prayers, and that I would be talking to you about spirituality and God, I'm not sure I would have believed you because I came to you with this hateful punishing concept of a higher power. All my life, I kept getting told God's punishing me for whatever it was. If I didn't believe, trust my parents, which I didn't, or I didn't do what they said, or when I was drinking, or even before that, when I made these promises and deals and stuff that happened, and I broke those promises and more stuff that happened. And Glass House is a church annex. It took me a while to even want to walk into that building because I thought the roof had fallen on me. And that didn't happen. I got welcomed with love and kindness and things to do and people that hugged me and loved me and didn't even know me and told me there's a way to be different, but I have to take certain actions and work the steps and then live them. Because Alcoholics Anonymous is a way of life. When I came to you, I had to work the steps. And now I got to live the steps. And sometimes I still get to work them. And on different levels. You know, I was trying to find somebody to make an amend from what happened on my 30th birthday when I was drunk. Couldn't find him. And the other day I did a search and found out he died in February. Right? So I only have today is what I know. And I get to do this the best I can. And some days it works really well. And some days it's like, Carol, we're going to give you some more opportunities to grow here, Carol. See, when I came into you, I was this big hunk of clay. Just a big lump. And as I'm going through sobriety, I have to ask God to change me because I don't have power. My best way of thinking and living got me to you the way it did. And I felt shame and guilt and remorse and all those words I didn't know but I read them in the big book and heard you describe them what yeah me too that restless irritable and discontent right it says alcohol's cunning baffling and powerful Carol it won't happen this time if you drink it'll be different but you know what recovery's cunning baffling and powerful and it's contagious and it's still contagious I still hear people, it doesn't matter if they have days or many more years than me, 
and they have the enthusiastic um, outlook and they have the opportunity to grow and to watch people change. It helps me and I get to hear your stories and I get to see you change and I get to see God working not only in my life, but in your life. And my higher power that I've come to know through Alcoholics Anonymous can work in a lot of our lives at the same time. God never says, Carol, I'm not helping you anymore. I did enough for you this week, right? He might say, Carol, it's not time yet. You know, it's our apartment hunting. And, and I kept saying, bless it or block it. And let me know the truth. And God, if it be your will, please put me in the place I can best use my talents and God-given abilities according to your purpose for my life. And God made it really clear I'm supposed to be right where I'm at. And it's okay to be right where I'm at. What I've learned is that I go somewhere else and I'm not okay where I'm at. I'm not going to be okay where I go. But if I'm okay where I'm at, I'll be okay wherever it is. That's what you've taught me. And so I, I just came and did what you said and got a sponsor and went through the steps. And even when I didn't want to take an action, I did it. And I had to pray I'm willing to be willing to be willing sometimes. And I had to find a higher power. And that was hard. To admit I was powerless over alcohol, that wasn't so hard. To manage my own life that I wasn't doing it real well, that I came to know also. You know, I remember being, it was a little while before I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, there was a stress test on TV and there were 30 questions. And like one to five is in stress. And then it goes up and it said, if you have 25 to 30, you are very stressed. You probably need some help. Now, I want to tell you, I scored 27 and had no idea what was wrong with my life. None. I thought everything's good. Yeah, I drank. I went to work every day. I didn't go to jail. I didn't get a DUI. Yeah, I drove drunk. I did blackout stuff. I did embarrassing stuff. But see, I showed up at work and I paid my bills. But my life's not unmanageable, right? But it was because when I drank, I had no control over what I was going to do and what was going to happen and how much I was going to drink. So yeah, I was powerless over alcohol. I knew I had crazy thoughts because I thought about suicide from the time I was a little kid. And I remember being, I don't know, nine or 10 and telling my mom I thought about killing myself. And you know what she said? Don't talk like that and don't think like that. So it was a secret until I got to you and I could tell you, yeah, I've had those thoughts. It's not a secret anymore. Because you told me I'm as sick as my secrets. And so I had to find this higher power and I did. I found it through having a sponsor named Lois. And a lot of you have heard me talk about Lois. She had got sober in 1966. She was 22 years sober. She had a third of a lung on oxygen for the last seven years of her life because she smoked and got emphysema and she was very frail. And we would talk and sometimes she would just run out of, out of oxygen and couldn't talk anymore. But she shared whatever she could until that happened. And we went through the steps and she told me I had to find a higher power. She told me I had to find a God that's going to help keep me sober, that I can't rely on humans, not to put her on a pedestal. You know, she died when I had a year sober, right before she had 23 years sober. May 17th, 1989, she became a newcomer in the sky. And I got more sobriety than she did because I had a year and she had a day, right? but she's still watching over me and lets me know she's around. But she taught me about a higher power. And when I read the big book, which was my instruction from her, read the big book, Carol, ask God to let you know God. Say, God, how, let me know how you want me to know you and keep showing me that you're there. And I have lots of God stories and experiences. And those are enlightening to me to know that I'm not walking this journey alone. I'm walking it with you, but I also have this higher power that I found through working the steps and praying. Prayers weren't a part of my life other than get me out of this, I won't do it again, or don't let this happen. Now the higher power I've come to know through Alcoholics Anonymous, my higher power is not a friend. It's not a parent. It's gotta be bigger than that and not be human, right? I learned not to trust and believe in my parents. They lied to me and they didn't do what they said. And I didn't want that as a higher power. 
And I didn't want something with human capabilities. I wanted something that was way bigger than that. And I could have it because it says in my big book, God's everything or nothing. What do I want God to be? Now, my God is so big. My God is gender neutral. And my God, the other day, right now it's sunny, but the other day it started out sunny. And then sometime during the day, you know what happened? There was thunder and heavy rain and wind. And then the sun came out for a while, a couple hours, and then it got rainy again. And then the sun came out and then it got dark. Now, I don't think any of you can do that because I know I can't. But I know that I have a higher power that loves me so much that gives me lots of things to grow through. Just like on this talk, I have no idea what God's having me share. Just whatever God, I prayed and I read my big book and I read another book of ours and said, okay, God, let it go how you want it to go. I have no control. And I found out my life is a lot better that way. See, when opportunity knocks at the door, I say, okay, God, what's there before I slam it in God's face and say, no, thank you. I have a picture in the background and it is something I took from a helicopter in West Palm Beach, Florida a few years ago. It reminds me that I'm just a little part of this world, that I'm just kind of a speck, but God sees farther and higher than that perspective is. In the background, all those buildings are in a haze because I don't know what God has coming. I don't know what God has planned. I know, I see a friend of mine's meeting. I'm sharing at his meeting tonight. I'm hosting it with four friends that are going to share their story tonight. Between now and then, I don't know what's happening and I don't want to know. You see, sometimes God surprises me. Sometimes God gives me what I call pop quizzes. When I was in school, they gave us pop quizzes. I, got, I was born in 1950, went to kindergarten at 1955 when I was five years old. Now, I don't know about when you were in school, but our teachers sometimes would say, okay, clear your desk, I'm giving you a quiz. Let's see what you learned here. And that's what God does in Alcoholics Anonymous for me. Carol, you have a good program and things go the way you want. What is it when they don't? What about when I throw these little things at you, Carol, unexpectedly? How are you handling this? Am I applying the principles of this program? Am I applying the steps to it? Am I doing what you taught me to do? The Lois taught me to rely on my big book and that I had to apply the steps, the traditions, and the concepts. And we're doing a concept story, and I'm learning a lot more about the concepts, and I'm learning how they apply to my life and to my relationships with all of you and how they're interconnected with the steps and the traditions. They told me it's a whole pie when I come to Alcoholics Anonymous. You're giving me a whole pie, whatever kind I want. Do I just want a bite using a fork or a spoon? Maybe do I want a slice? And if I want a slice, do I want a skinny one or a really big slice? Or do I want the whole pie? I want the whole pie because I like sugar and sweets and I want the most, right? If it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing, I've learned. When I had to pull up weeds in my yard when I lived in Fort Worth, I had to do them all in one day, right? Couldn't break it up into a couple of days. But God gives me chances for patience sometimes. Carol, it's not ready for you. See, when God wants me to have the best, right? But sometimes I'm not ready for whatever that is God has for me, or sometimes whatever it is isn't ready for me. But when I'm ready and that situation or that person or experience or lesson is ready, God will put it together. Sometimes they're fun and happy and wonderful, and sometimes they're a little challenging and difficult. And I get to grow through it, and I get to apply the principles of this program harder. Because life happens. But on the top of page 100, it says that me and a new person, maybe one of you I don't know yet, doesn't matter if you're new to the program or not. I get to walk with you. And it says, if I persist, remarkable things will happen. That when I put myself in God's hands, it is when I look back. But not always when I look back. Sometimes I see it as I'm going through it. 
But when I put myself in God's hands, the things that come to me are far more wonderful than I could have imagined. So follow the dictates of that higher power and I'll presently live in a new and wonderful world, no matter what the present circumstance. That means right this minute. That doesn't mean next week or tonight. It means right now. And there's times life happens and I go, okay, right now all I have to do is breathe. Maybe all I have to do is sit still, be still and know that I'm God, they taught me. Pause when agitated or doubtful. Work the steps through situations and experiences. How do I know how connected I am to a higher power? I had to figure that out when I was new. The way I came up with it, and it may work for you or it may not, I'm a Libra, I was born in September, so I think of the scale, right? Am I thinking about more about God and the blessings and recovery and all of you? Or am I thinking about more about whatever that is, right? I've got to think more about God and recovery if I want to have that. The other way I look at it, that I used to love magicians when I was a kid. And if you watched magicians many years ago, they would have a table set with china and glasses and candelabras and silverware and all these fancy things on the table now sometimes the the magician he'd pull that tablecloth out and nothing moved that means if i have something happen in life right when i'm on the road in my camper van and the transmission quits or my parents are dying or i get cancer which all those things happened right? If I'm connected to God, then it gets handled just right the way it's supposed to, and I don't get upset or anything. Nothing moved when the tablecloth came out. If I'm kind of connected to God, I might get a little upset. You know, the glasses may tilt off over and the silverware may fall or something may happen. Not major catastrophe. But if I'm not connected at all to God and any of those things happen, then everything crashes to the floor. Maybe I would drink over it. And I haven't had to have that happen, thankfully, since I came to Alcoholics Anonymous on May 1st, 1988. I didn't go to treatment. I didn't go to therapy. I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and worked really hard on what you told me to do, applying the program of Alcoholics Anonymous to my life. And you took care of me, you know, the depression and the anxiety, all that left when I didn't have those fears anymore because of working through the steps and staying involved in my recovery. It told me to put as much effort into my recovery as I did into my drinking. And I did that. I didn't want to feel the way I felt and I didn't want to drink. And when I met Lois, I was about five weeks sober. We went through the steps right away. That's what the big book says doesn't say anywhere in my big book, Carol, wait till you feel like doing the steps. Take your time. Don't rush. It can take years. You'll be all right. No, it doesn't. It says next and at once and continue. It says if you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, I can take certain steps. And I had to do that because I didn't want to be like I was. They told me if I keep doing what I'm doing, I'm going to keep getting what I'm getting. And if I like it, keep doing it. And if I don't, I can change it. And Lois told me, I don't think my way into right acting. I change my actions and my thinking changes. And that's been my experience too. Now, Lois gave me certain things to do. And it made me connect to a higher power and to all of you. And she gave me prayers to use and you all gave me prayers at meetings. Like you said, I always sat in the back corner and they said, sit in the front row and ask to be a part of, not apart from. And when you would go out to eat after a meeting to go with you and have a meeting after the meeting and come to meetings early, make coffee, talk to people, greet people, look for people more scared than me and get women's numbers and learn to call them. And I got to do that. And I get to have those spiritual awakenings just by doing little things you told me. And I kept doing more and more. And what I found out is the longer I was sober, the more I have to do to keep the same level of contented sobriety. Because I like contented sobriety. I don't want to just be sober, like white knuckle sober. When I said I can go two weeks without a drink, I don't have a problem. 
it wasn't fun to be sober then. What happened like that is I wanted to drink because it wasn't fun and it was emotionally painful and I didn't like it. I didn't want to be like that anymore. I lived that way till I got to you at the age of 37 and a half. And I didn't want to be that way anymore. So I had to pray sometimes for willingness because all those things I did to survive were my survival tools. And then you're giving me new things to try and new ways to live and steps to apply to my life. And they weren't fun sometimes. Like doing a four step, I didn't want to do it. But I had to do it if I want to stay sober. The third step in my big book and step three, it says it's a spiritual step. It says it's vital and crucial. I did the third step prayer. I don't get on my knees to pray. God hears me no matter what I'm doing and where I'm at. It's what mine does. And I say, okay, God, however this goes, I get a lesson and experience to grow through to share with somebody else someday. I ask God for strength and God gives me difficulties to overcome that make me stronger. And it's not that storm that gets me. It's that forecast because I go through the big stuff pretty good. It's all the little stuff that tries to rock my boat, right? The what ifs. What if it happens this way? What if? What I've learned is that's part of where one of the steps it says I use energy foolishly. It doesn't work well to do that. And I don't entertain stinking thinking at all because what I've learned is it doesn't stay where it's not wanted. I've learned healthy people don't want to be around unhealthy people a lot. And unhealthy people don't want to be around us positive, healthy people. I get a choice to want to be a victim or a conqueror, a hero in my life story. I don't want to be a victim anymore. So I get to do all the things you told me. I'm going to tell you what Lois had me do because it really worked. And it's been working for other people that I share it with. She told me every day I go to meetings with now, whether they're online or in person. Now we have online meetings that we've had since 1986, but I get to see pictures. I get to hear sound. I get to reconnect with some of you that I wrote a long time ago. I used to do Loners International, which I still do. It's letters by mail to people around the world, like an AA pen pal club. And I've met some of my pen pals online and I've met people that knew some of them. Some of them are gone now, but people knew them. And so that's really a nice connection. There's lots of ways to stay sober besides just meeting. Meetings don't keep us sober. They keep us connected, but there's lots of other ways. Phone calls are really important. Not just text, but call people and hear a voice. I love it. I try to still do that, make phone calls every day do a lot of texts, but I make phone calls or somebody will say, do you have time to talk? Yeah, let's do it. And we do. So Lois told me in the morning and at night, sometime during the day to read the third and seven step prayers. You can, I can read them out of the big book or I can modify them. And I do. I've modified them over the years. Sometimes they're shorter. Sometimes they're longer. Sometimes they're almost what's in the big book. And sometimes they're a little different. Right. Like, I will tell you what I changed in the seventh step. My third step sometimes is, okay, God, today's your day. Let's, I invite myself into God's day, I've learned. I don't invite God into my small, limited human day. I invite myself into God's day because God has things happen I couldn't have imagined or dreamed of. Not only in my life, but I hear it in your life. And I say, okay, God, let's see how it goes today. Let me do, be willing to do your will and watch for the opportunities you put in my path to be of service. Step seven is God take all of me and give me back what you want me to have today. They're not good or bad things. They're just lessons and experiences to grow through to share with you and other people. I started to tell you before I came in is this big hunk of clay, right? And as I'm going through the steps and I'm sharing and life is happening, what I find is God takes this scalpel and he goes, Carol, that's not you. That's not yours. And takes a big hunk of clay out. And then sometimes God can take another really big hunk of clay because I did the first step and I go, oh, that's not mine. You mean somebody's telling me that and I believed it? Big hunk of clay comes off. Right? God fine tunes me. And then sometimes it's, Carol, we don't need to take a big hunk. We just need you know, a little scalpel here and maybe a finer grit sandpaper here and 
and God is sculpting me into what God wants me, Carol, to be. And it changes sometimes, right? And I get to sometimes just be a, whatever God wants me to be that day. So Lois told me in the morning and at night and sometime during the day, Carol, read the third and seventh step prayers. Read page 68 to 71. Ask God to help me set my ideals and live up to them. I think it says mold my ideals and live up to them. She said, Carol, if you don't know how you want to live and the principles you want to live by, how are you going to make decisions to know that you're in accordance with that? When you have to make decisions, Carol, once you know how you want to live and what your morals and your principles and your values are, when things happen in life, are they in accordance with that or not? If they are, I'm probably on the right track. If I'm going against them, I might be on the way to take a drink. If I'm not being honest, if I'm not telling you what's going on in my life, if I'm saying I'm okay when I'm not, right? All these different things. And then she had me read 84 to 88, and those pages are so important to me. And I was doing them from when I met her at five weeks sober. I didn't wait till I did all the steps to get to that. You know, in the early days, they got people through the steps sometimes in a weekend or days. They didn't wait years. Let's see, steps 10 and 11 are really important to me because they tell me how to live. They give me my instructions. I never had an instruction booklet before on how to live life. There used to be a book they talked about when I got sober, and I think it was called something like, All I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. I didn't learn anything like that in life. I learned you do what your parents say or you get whooped, right? You do what your teachers say or they'll hit you with a ruler. And other stuff, I didn't know how to do it. You know, I was the oldest of three kids and my parents would go, Carol, you're the oldest, you should know better. How? Who's teaching me? I didn't know. You know, when I went to work, they taught me how to do certain things I was doing for my job. But Alcoholics Anonymous, you give me a textbook with instructions, with prayers, with all kinds of information. How cool is that? See, step 10 tells me what to watch for every day. Selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. I add overwhelmed. I add uncertainty. I add frustrated. I can add any words I want. Step 11 says... Upon awakening, think about the 24 hours ahead. Now, you told me if 24 hours is too much, just think about right now or an hour. You know, they used to say we could start our day over again. We don't hear it anymore. But I don't want to start my day over again. I want to learn from what happened and go from there, maybe change it or modify it or learn from it. And then it says when I retire at night. Now, I read all of those sections all the time because see when I read it at night I know what I'm gonna have to watch for when I read do step 10 I know what I'm watching for and doing at 11 and then when I go to bed at night after I read the nighttime part I read the morning part because that is in my brain and when I wake up I just reaffirm it just like when I read in the morning I read the nighttime part and I read step 10 and then I know what to watch for during the day and what I'm going to be accountable for at night. Somehow it works. Then I had to write a gratitude list of things I did to help myself, a steam list and a journal and prayers. Now, I never really prayed other than get me out of this, but the prayers Lois gave me, I still use them and I will share them with you. I don't know if I remember everyone to share right now, but one of them was, Carol, if it be, ask God, if it be God's will, can you please not do things to hurt yourself anymore? And what I found out for that is I would eat better, I would sleep, I'd keep my mouth shut. I don't like confrontation, so sometimes I would speak up for myself. Right? You taught me the concept number five says the minority voice is as strong as the majority voice. That just because I don't agree with you, I don't have to not say something that I can have another opinion. She said, Carol, they can be wrong and I don't have to be right. If I'm not comfortable with something, I can hang up for the phone and say, I'm not comfortable discussing that. 
or let people verbally abuse me. I don't do that anymore. And I wrote a gratitude list in the journal and the things I did to help my self-esteem list. And I called through at least three women a day. And I was of service and I looked for people more scared than me and got those women's numbers. And I still do it online. I have a whole, I keep a little pad right by my phone here. Pencils and pens, write numbers, people I want to connect with. Maybe you're in a country I've never heard somebody from and I don't have friends. I have over 2,300 numbers in my telephone all over the world. I find lots of ways to be of service online. There's so many opportunities. If you're not sure how, let me know and I'll be glad to share them with you. My number's on the screen always. I can't give you a piece of paper like I used to. And I can't give you hugs like I like to. And, you know, we go to in-person meetings now. Our group started meeting at our old location and I got to go. But what I've learned is if you go to meetings, they taught me to be aware. If I go to a meeting, look for people that I don't recognize and go up to them. Don't hang out in my little cliques where I'm not greeting people. When I go to online meetings, make sure I'm aware and welcome people to the meeting and don't just chit chat with people that I don't, that I know. And I don't get into outside issues either. They taught me the principles of the program and the traditions are important to my life, not just to a group. I've been through a lot of stuff sober. I've been through cancer a few times and I've had a lot of body altering surgery and my parents dying and I've gotten to go to five international conventions and have God stories from those. At two years sober, I was at a bus stop in Seattle at the international. And a man comes up and he goes, were you in Los Angeles at a meeting a few months ago? I was, I was at Clancy's 30th anniversary. He said, I'm the one that picked you up and took you to the meeting. What are the odds? so many odds i got to share at a loners international meeting two years sober and a man came up and he said you're the first person that wrote to me on my first anniversary no i think it was my third anniversary i came home and there was a little box on my doorstep and i opened it it was a little wood duck he carved and sent to me i get wonderful experiences being sober i heard a lady we used to listen to cassette tapes you know, the other thing is I drank at home the last years of my drinking. And Lois said, I don't want you home thinking about drinking. So I went to a meeting before work and I went to a couple of meetings after work. And I got cassette tapes. I wasn't spending my money on alcohol anymore. I put the much, much effort into my sobrieties I did into my drinking. And so I drank when I cooked and I was, I didn't drink when I was driving, but I drank when I got to wherever it was. So what I did is I listened to a cassette tape when I'm cooking. I listened to a cassette tape when I was driving to work and driving home from work and getting a lot of recovery. Listen to the big book. You can even go to aa.org and they have the 12 and 12 in the big book on audio there. And there's lots of different websites to listen to recordings on for free now. We didn't have that when I got sober. But I keep asking God to show me God's there. And one of those recordings, this lady, I don't remember who she was, but she said she's 42 years old and she was 15 years sober. And she said to her sponsor, is this all there is in life? Do I have nothing else to look forward to? Her sponsor said, ask God to let you know deep in your heart that the best is yet to come. I don't want to think that I'm 72 and a half, closer to 73 and 34 years and 11 months sober and think this is all there is. No, God's got a lot more. I don't know what it is. This month in about two weeks is 10 years ago. I had all the symptoms the doctor told me to watch for at the end of my life that I wouldn't live much longer. The end of 2012, when she told me, I, mean, I grow tumors in my body and had surgery and anyway, Still got a lot of chronic pain and health issues and more tumors in my body and my brain and everything else. And my doctor said, watch for these symptoms, but you're not going to live a year. So at the end of 2012, I sold my condo. I gave everything I owned away. I made my funeral arrangements. I got in my camper van and traveled. And guess what? 
I was in Tennessee and I had all those symptoms and I'm coming back. And there's a story I wrote on my website that carolsadventures.com has lots of stories and poems and stuff, travels. And you know what? I'm still here. There's a book I like, and it says, here's a test to find out if your mission on earth is accomplished. If you're still alive, it isn't. So evidently, God's not ready yet. But you know what? In 2013 and 14, when July 4th came and my birthday came and Thanksgiving came, I said, God, this is the last one I'll see. And then, you know what? It wasn't. And I stopped living that. I never sat and just waited to die, though. I kept living and living life to the fullest because I only have today. I just have right this minute, you know. And I don't know what God has for later. I don't know what happens tomorrow. I get to just experience life and share it with you. And, and I keep getting to see how big God is. And I get to keep seeing God working in my life. And especially when I take my trips in my camper van. And I'm hoping to leave in May for five or six months and go visit some of you, go out west again. I went away for two and a half months and I got to meet some of you and have experiences this past fall. And God has these things. It's always kind of, all right, God, I'm going to take a trip. What's going to happen this time? I've had the transmission go out. I've had water leaks. I've had, I mean, all kinds of cool stuff happen. And you know what I know where God guides, God provides, because every time something happens, God has me in a spot where it gets fixed and I don't have to worry about it that God takes care of me. I go into God's day. Sometimes I use God like a blanket to comfort me and keep me warm and comforted. And sometimes God's this plexiglass shield that I put around me or hold in front of me and nothing can hurt me. My foundation in Alcoholics Anonymous is solid. My third step foundation is solid because I put in the work, I stay involved. And you know what? One of my friends, I don't think she'd mind me sharing it because she had years and drank. Few of my friends had years and drank and picked up without thinking about it. And I want to tell you that when I was 31 and a half years sober, that could have been me that did that. You know, I was going to one meeting a week and I was talking to y'all and praying and reading and doing the stuff. Now I go to four to eight meetings a week. I'm real involved. I've got book studies and history meetings and sponsor people and do all that. But I'm going to tell you, at 31 and a half years sober, alcohol is that subtle foe. It wants to sneak in every now and then and say, you know what? Remember me? Pick me up and I'll show you. I'm not going to be different this time. It's not better out there. When I go to Texas and I help my friends at their bakery, they make vanilla extract with vanilla beans and vodka. It takes a few months to shake up that bottle with the vanilla beans. One of my friends not in the program gave me vanilla beans and at 31 and a half years sober, my first thought was, Carol, go buy a bottle of vodka and put the vanilla beans in it and make extract. You won't drink it, Carol. And I didn't tell y'all it started sound like a good idea. I did tell one of my friends and she goes, Carol, it's not a good idea. I didn't tell anybody else. And then I go to one of the big stores and guess what? I go in the liquor section. How much is a bottle of vodka? I go, this is really dangerous, Carol. You don't need to be doing this. And I called my sponsor and I told my group when I went to the meeting and we laughed and you know what? It let go. And I didn't think about it again other than telling it to you. See, I have to be on guard, not all the time, just these little thoughts. And it's not always about the alcohol. It's Carol, do you really want to tell your story on enlightenment? You don't know anything about this. It's my voice is telling me you don't know anything about enlightenment. And then this other voice says, Carol, look up the word. Carol, you've had spiritual experiences. You have a lot of God's stories. You can do it. That's the voice I listen to. Not the stinking thinking, get out of here. I choose to not let you sabotage my recovery. I'm honored and grateful, and I hope something I shared you can use or helps you. Thank you for letting me step out of my comfort zone and grow a little bit more. I feel honored and blessed that I get to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous in good standing.
and I'm willing to go to any length to be sober because the life you have given me is way beyond anything I could have imagined. It's not dull and boring like I thought it would be when I got sober. It's full of excitement, love, adventure. They told me faith is further adventure and trusting him or her, whatever a higher power is, and adventure's the key word. My friend Ken says, be a verb. I love y'all. So great, Carol. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, I'm just going to mute everyone again with the left. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Charlotte and I am an alcoholic, a very grateful alcoholic, actually. Um, wow, Carol. <laughs> Do you know? I don't I don't know. I, it's like, where does this come from? <laughs> you know, <laughs> no wonder we all love you so much. We are like, you are, oh my gosh. Everything. I mean, it's hard, isn't it, when you hear such powerful stories like yours to even think or think to say anything back so I thought in case I'll put a say about my enlightenment and funny enough you say uh, my enlightenment is like I, I feel like I honestly when I think back about how I got here I look at when there's a program years ago called Mr Ben and he walks through the wardrobe and he's somewhere else or or you've got um um, lying rich in the wardrobe and you walk through this Narnia. It's like, it's unbelievable, really. It's a, it, and here I am. And I, like you say, who would have thought I'm sitting here and, and I, or when I'm at home, I want to talk to God. I, you know, I, I want to stay as close, connected as I can. I live in a spiritual world and a spiritual being. Oh, and I love every part of it. There's nothing about it I don't. Who would have thought, you know? And, uh, and to me, that's enlightenment. Um, and learn, and then someone saying to me, like I can remember when I first um, when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and they were talking about God, and I went, and those it, like these people were quite cool. Now I can see them. I said, "What really?" And they said, "No, really, there is a God." I've just been reminded the recording's still on. It's editing to be done. Bear with me. <laughs> 